<clears throat> Welcome, everybody. We're going to be doing uh, the Weather Channel case study. I know you're all very excited about it. I'm doing a quick head count. I count about 12 people. They're all lame jokes. That's all I've got. I'm just setting it up. If I lower the bar now, there's nowhere to go but up. Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a long hour. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we're going to talk a little about the Weather Channel, the, um, what we did, where we're going, and that sort of thing. But first, some introductions. I want to introduce one of the more brilliant web technologists I know. My name is Jason. <laughs> this is also Chris. Uh, my name is Chris Hill. I'm Vice President of Web Development at the Weather Channel. It's and great I, to be here. And I'm Jason Smith, <laughs> Enterprise Solutions Architect with Media Current. Um, media current folks are spread out throughout the audience, so they'll overhear your every word. Nothing? They can't, they can't all be winners. <laughs> you guys have to get used to it. It's, I'm sorry. I've been living it for a long time. So we're going to start with um, you know, talking about who the Weather Channel is. Chris will introduce the company, what some of the challenges they deal with on a regular basis are. We're going to talk about what the selection process was, how we arrived at Drupal, why it was a good choice talk about what we did for the Drupal uh, project. Um, I have slides that go into deep technical detail, but we're probably not going to have time to go into them. If there's a lot of interest, I'll try to do it during the QA. Or if we have extra time, I'll spend some time on them. Next, we're going to talk about where we're going next, and hopefully have some time for QA. I apologize if I'm nervous, because my boss is sitting in the front row, and he's going to be grading me every minute of the way, I'm sure. <laughs> Um, first, I want to tell you guys a little bit about the Weather Channel. I know most people have heard about the Weather Channel, um, but it's an amazing company. Um, I've been there for 14 years. Um, we really care about people and trying to keep people safe, trying to make sure that everybody's got the latest weather for where they are and what they're doing. Um, and we do this through the use of what we call our four S's. Uh, the four S's are science, stories, services, and safety. So through stories, we try to tell stories that are inspiring and illuminating to, to our viewers and our, and our customers. Um, we use the best in science to try to make our uh, forecast local and, and appropriate for where you are and what you're doing. Um, services so that you can receive important information that makes your family safe, um, even if you're not on our website or not using our mobile apps. We can send you alerts. We can do things to try to keep you safe, even when you're not tightly engaged with us. Um, and again, safety kind of already covered that, but safety is extremely important to us. Um, we want to be there for you when there's severe weather. Um, we invest a lot of money and time, uh, a lot of highly dedicated people trying to make sure that we are bringing you accurate and, and, and relevant information so that you stay, safe, you stay safe and your family is safe when there's severe weather and when you're just concerned about the pollen being high. Um, and overall, um, we like to remind our customers that it's amazing out there. So just um, some, and I cannot even read this screen because it's too small, um, but uh, just some, some, some basic metrics about our site. Um, on a daily basis, we have about uh, 50 million page views. Um, about half of those come back to our origin, back to our actual servers. Um, we have about 30 million unique visitors um, a month. Um, we all host that through um, three, data, three data centers with about 144 servers. Um, and we have approximately 17,000 articles that our content team has been curating over a number of years, some that they reuse, some that they don't reuse. Um, and I can't see what the other things are. And um, also, no, another important thing that we provide is, is dynamic weather maps. We have some map generation software um, that we use on our website, we use on our, on our, on our television channel. Um, there's lots and lots of weather maps, radar, s satellite, shields that show, you know, temperatures, uh, cold fronts, warm fronts, things like that. Um, so a lot of very engaging weather maps. So one thing that uh, was really uh, kind of a, a crucial point for us in October 2012 was Superstorm Sandy. Um, I think most people were familiar with Superstorm Sandy. Um, it's, you know, our, our, our Super Bowl, you know, we, we, we heard a talk last night from um, a guy from Turner, and he was describing their Super Bowl as when they were, when they were handling March Madness. Uh, for us, our Super Bowl comes 
you know, multiple times a year when we have tornadoes and hurricanes and, and, and severe weather. Um, Superstorm Sandy was a special condition where we did 300 million page views on one day. Now, granted, all 300 million were, a lot of them were highly cacheable, but it goes to, it goes to the point that, um, you know, we, we, we desperately have to have a highly cacheable environment for, for the site that we present. Um, but we got tons and tons of traffic on that day. Um, over that, that week of the storm, we handled about a billion requests to our site, um, and we presented over 170 million videos, video streams. And video streams are not a big deal because everybody knows that videos are cached, but nonetheless, um, the engagement is important. It's an important thing to, to, to recognize that when, when severe weather happens, people come to us and they rely on us, and we have to make sure that our systems are there and ready to serve. So I wanted to take the opportunity. Oh, excuse me. I wanted to take the opportunity to point something out while we're on the same subject. The this is a um, Omniture report from the day of the San Superstorm Sandy or the week of the Superstorm Sandy. You'll see that their nominal traffic was about 100 million page views, and uh, in one day it jumped to three times that number. Topic of uh, scalability is something that comes up a lot. It's a very important topic, but it's a topic that causes enough pain it causes a bit of topical depression. Yikes. You're welcome for that one. But the point I was trying to make with this slide is actually that the way the current architecture is built, you have to build, oops, you have to build in capacity for this spike. So we have servers that are there ready at all times to handle this spike. What we'd like to do is move to a, platform, a system, a platform, a framework, insert other word here, um, that'll allow you to scale up on demand. We want to move to the cloud rather than having all of these servers ready all the time. 90% of the time, we've got servers that are just sitting idle. What would be really nice if we could scale up when an, something like that happens. All right, so in, in October, or in 2012, we decided that we, we made the decision that we wanted to rebuild our digital infrastructure. Um, we, we have a solid system that that works, it's, it's there, it delivers, but we knew it didn't give us the feature velocity that we needed to move forward in the next 15 years. So we created this, we, we established a project and sold it. Um, we call it the Digital Infrastructure Reboot, um, basically going through and, and cleaning house, rebuilding everything from scratch. Two main components of that Digital Infrastructure Reboot. First was um, our data services layer, um, providing the best in data services to our products. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but then the content management system, which is why you're here today. Um, so as we went through to determine what the content management system was that the Weather Channel needed, um, we developed an objective scorecard that had about 20 criteria on it. And uh, in some of those criteria, the main ones, you know, feature velocity, you know, being able to, um, having a system that allowed us to rapidly, you know, create content, create products, and deploy them to the site. Um, the reuse of content, so I can take a module or something that I build on big web and I can reuse it on mobile web or perhaps even a mobile app. Um, scalability, Jason already mentioned, um, our servers sit idle you know, 80% of the time, a lot of them do. Um, so we wanna have a situation where we uh, run with what we need until we need more and then we can scale up um, by utilizing the cloud. Uh, maintainability, trying to have a uh, a set of tools and a set of software products that we build that are easy to maintain, you know, ideally easy to build and easy to maintain um, over time. Um, and publishing capabilities. You know, we're a rapid, rapid publishing environment. We publish lots of content around the clock, um, especially when we have severe weather, um, pages, page changes. We have a lot of, lot of uh, content that, we, that we're rapidly publishing on the site. So we went through and, you know, we looked at multiple products. We looked at Adobe CQ. We looked at, we looked at the, you know, the big gorillas in the, in the, in the marketplace. We, WCQ, SDL Tridian, um, OpenText. Uh, we even looked at WordPress and, you know, psychotically, we even looked at .NET Nuke for about five minutes. Um, um, because someone wanted to look at it, so we did it. Um, and, you know, after we filled out the scorecard, you know, Drupal was a resounding winner. Um, it blew everything out of the water. Um, so we ended up choosing, um, choosing Drupal as our content management system, um, which would have been awkward if we had not chosen it, and I'm here today. But anyway. Um, so the next step was figuring out how we're going to build this thing. Um, so um, when we 
evaluated, yeah, so we evaluated vendors because we, we needed to figure out how we're going to go ahead about building this thing. Um, so we, you know, looked out to, you know, the, the players that are out there and ended up choosing Media Current as our development partner. <laughs> to my dismay. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, Dave Terry. Um, so the approach we took was, oh, I'm sorry, this is your slide. <clears throat> <laughs> so we, um, Acquia and Media Current came to the table. We did a little series of mini discoveries, which in this context you might call a series of lightning talks. All right, that's the last one. Fine. <laughs> it's funny that the non-jokes get more laugh than the jokes. Yeah. Um, what we got out of that was a good idea of what it is they were trying to accomplish in the aggregate. And from those dis uh, discussions, we developed a series of proofs of concept. And those proofs of concept were things that like uh, building a Drupal site that would allow page building under their particular requirements or uh, rewriting the page in the browser to meet you know, whatever uh, scalability needs they have. Um, then after we were brought into the project, we did a deep dive, which is we spent time getting to know every part of the project. We learned how video was managed. We learned how images were managed. We learned how slideshows were managed. We took a nap. We learned how all the rest of the site was managed. We also learned how the team dynamics worked. We learned what their processes were. We figured out what, where we would fit into the, the group as a whole so that we would assign the right resources so that the, we could be, provide the most benefit, the most return on investment. All right, so the engagement. Um, so, you know, we, we no, I jumped ahead. I, I had already announced that we picked you guys. But Could we back up, everybody? Yeah, so forget the last two minutes. Um, so the way the Weather Channel works, when we have a problem, we, we, we attack it aggressively. We'll go hire some contractors, put them in a room, throw raw meat in there, and, and build what we need built. Um, so when we decided to, to go with Drupal, um, we went out and, you know, we, we interviewed Drupal uh, developers. Um, one of the key components for working, uh, choosing CMS was to have a, a, a CMS that had availability of resources in the marketplace. And you know, we we looked and we found we found some really good people. We found some 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 great developers, but we didn't feel like we could find a a cohesive team that um, that we felt could take us to the to the end zone could to, could help us build this this big thing. Um, so then we ended up looking, you know, we were in contact with Acquia um, and, and Media Current and ended up choosing Media Current because they were able to deliver, um, they were able to deliver a, 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 a large team that could be there for us and do and cover all the different aspects of Drupal, um, things that we didn't have the skills to do and didn't really have, you know, frankly have time to learn ourselves. Um, so we established that team and then we had to have a kick-ass Drupal architect, and um, luckily we found we found Jason. Um, and oh, thanks. <laughs> um, um, and then we also have an internal team. So you know, Media Current is kind of the Drupal arm for for the project, and we we established an internal team of about seven or eight people that help identify all the different pieces and parts of the current infrastructure that we need to replace. Um, and help bridge the gap for data migrations and you know new functionality that we want to build, um, and largely work closely with Media Current on a daily basis, um, even when they're not in my office, which is another problem, but that's okay. Um, and through that relationship between the two teams, we've been very successful and made a lot of progress. Um, and then we just start building. So, what made Drupal a better fit for us? You know, open source rocks. I think most of you would all agree with that. Um, the Weather Channel has long been, has long time been a supporter of, of open source. Um, our entire current infrastructure that we use today for web serving is open source, except ironically for the part that we most want to replace, our content management system, which is not. Um, so going with an open source solution was extremely, um, you know, um, attractive to us because we've got a lot of experience with open source. We know what open source can bring to the table. We know that there's a community behind it. We know that it's going to be there and it's going to grow. And if for some reason the community abandons it, we can grow it ourselves. We can, at least we, our investment is always going to be secured. Um, the fact that, that Media Current is local was a big help. Um, you know, they, Media Current operates on a on a on a model where you know folks are scattered around the country, so they can best attract their different their different customers um, 
as, as best they can. And, and we've got, in Atlanta, they've got a large group of people that are you know, very accessible to us, that spend a lot of time with us. Um, um, so having a local vendor was really, really helpful. We didn't want to engage a company that was 500 miles away that we never got to see them. And, you know, Google Hangouts are great, but seriously, I need some bodies in front of me that I could touch and feel. Um, this, not inappropriately, though. Um, the, sc the scorecard screamed Drupal to us. I mean, when we already mentioned that the scorecard said, Drupal's your choice. That's what you got to use, and that's what we used. Um, and what the hell, Drupal's free, so why not use it? I mean, some of the other products we looked at, half a million dollars, million dollar license fees. Um, I mean, Drupal hasn't been free to implement because we still have to build it, but even if we were to choose one of these third-party tools, we'd still have to spend a million dollars on, on building the product to our needs. So big benefits there. So test drive. Um, somewhere along the lines, um, we decided that you know, our content entry solution was painful. Um, our VP of content entry was complaining constantly about problems that we're having entering article content. Um, Jason will go into more details of some of the pains that they, they suffered. Um, so we decided that we would try to implement, take Drupal and, and do a, a side project and, and implement content entry on Drupal um, to plug into our current web delivery hardware or web delivery framework. Um, and we, we called that project DICE, Drupal Interim Content Entry. It's been live since May of last year. Um, it's been extremely successful. From the day that we launched it, um, content velocity has gone through the roof. Um, multiple tools consolidated into a single tool. Uh, the user are, users are happy, as happy as a content entry team could actually be. They were happy. Um, and our support went to almost nil. We, I mean, our current content management system um, and our implementation, constant problems. Um, Lots of inflexibility, um, lots of maintenance, not lots of maintenance problems, and and and, and drag on our team, um, keeping us from actually building new things. So um, support went to nothing. So it was a big, big, big win. And the the side effect was it gave us some early unexpected validation that Drupal was in fact the right choice. So what will be the impact of um, the introduction to Drupal? I already mentioned consolidating multiple systems um, into the Drupal framework. Image management, um, Jason will talk about that in a minute. Um, image management was always a big issue for us. Uh, we were able to consolidate that tightly into, into Drupal slideshows and, and image uploads. Amazing um, increase in velocity by the, by the team. Um, tight integration of page building and page serving. Um, at one point we thought that was a bad thing. Um, and we're still going to be slightly um, segregated because of our use of ESI and cache ability. Um, and Jason will talk about that in a minute. Um, but we feel really comfortable with the way um, Drupal handles pages and, and consolidates that in its web framework. Um, and ultimately it gives us more agility in, in creating solutions. We can build products faster um, with some of the technology we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, so we can rapidly build products, make quick changes um, as, as the needs of our product, as our product team, you know, frequently changes. Right, Krista? Um, um, also, and then we already mentioned stability, you know, much, much more stability, um, and which ultimately gives us more time to actually build new things. So the advantages Drupal brought to the things that we just talked about, Drupal uses a standard stack. That means that we are not supporting Java here. We're not supporting Scala there. We're not supporting, you know, uh, this environment, that environment, six environments. We're all on, on a single stack for every uh, integrated portion of the site that they actually want to use. It's got a robust API, so when it comes to uh, changing requirements, which, by the way, just like the weather, the only thing you can count on changing is requirements. Um, but um, bum, but um, bum, yeah. I'm going to get a rim what shot What a terrible sound. audience. I'm going to get a rim shot sound bite. Um, because of the robust API, when things did change, when there was a pivot in requirements, we didn't have to you know, go right back to the drawing board. We were able to you know, readapt. We, we, when we architected, we architected in a way that it was easy to take this piece, replace it with that piece, take this piece, replace it with that. Drupal made that process a lot simpler. So um, the, whoop, excuse me. the number one challenge that we were faced with was retiring or um, integrating, if possible, a lot of the legacy platforms. There's also a transitional period that has to be addressed for which we have to support both. 
We needed to simplify the content entry, and we needed to increase feature velocity. So let's talk about how we do that a bit. So we, under the legacy platform, we had an article management system, an image management system, and a slideshow management system. They were written by three different people at three different times and do not integrate very well at all. When somebody wanted to create an article, they'd open up the article platform, write a few paragraphs, close it, load up the image system, create a couple of assets, save the asset IDs to a notepad, close the image system, open the slideshow system, copy the asset IDs out of the notepad into the slideshow system, close the slideshow system, open the article, take out a notepad all the asset IDs, post it in there, publish the article, save the article, deploy the article. Can you go through that again, please? Yes. <laughs> Later. What we were able to do was Yeah, the launch went that well too. <laughs> bam. Yeah, bam. So we were able to integrate the image management system, the article management system, and the slideshow management system with off-the-shelf components for the most part. The legacy migration content, that was just basically uh, after save hooks that we implemented that updated the legacy platform so we could migrate uh, easily. The systems we weren't able to integrate directly into Drupal, such as video management, because of the timeline it was too complex, we abstracted them through a web services interface so that when it's retired at a later time, we just match the, the RESTful interface and everything works as before. It's transparent. So Drupal's good at this kind of thing. This is a kind of diagram I bring up to tell you how good Drupal is at wrapping other services. The canonical example is when, when Facebook released their API, within 24 hours, Drupal had a Facebook module that allowed you to wrap and put Facebook content onto your site. Um, Media Current, in particular, is a big contributor to the open source and modules. Um, I think that most of the, oops, almost all of these uh, marketing automation modules are created by Media Current, in particular. Sounds like you might be bragging a little. <laughs> Holla! So some of the uh, we already we already mentioned earlier some of the uh, some of the problems we've got. I can't caching undo that. Is one of the, was one of the top problems. Um, you know, with caching, you know, low, low cache efficiency equals more hits back to your origin servers. Uh, when more traffic comes back to origin, you need more servers. More servers equals higher cost to operate and maintain, which is generally a bad a bad thing. Um, with, with, without good cacheability, you have to highly anticipate the traffic spikes and be fully scaled or highly scaled at all times, which is what we're doing today. So traditionally, when you're dealing with a lot of traffic from various places around the world, you just let it hit origin, and that's not a problem. But when you get a lot of traffic, the server can't keep up. So what you'll do is you'll just introduce a caching layer, something like Akamai. And so when the first request comes through, it hits Akamai. Akamai gets it, saves it, and every future request just goes to Akamai. Origin is happy, sitting there idle, and you're not paying a huge operational costs for a whole room full of servers. However, Weather Channel poses some unique challenges. This is what you might see if you visited from Austin, Texas. You'll get that forecast. But if you're just a couple miles away, or three hours, as I am intimately familiar with the drive, you will get a different forecast, which means on a regional basis, you're getting completely different pages, which means your, your um, cache, uh, cacheability breaks down on regional lines. And we're talking about zip codes and, and even so smaller subdivisions. If you have a large enough yard, you could be in the front and the backyard and get two completely different pages. So how did we address this particular challenge? What we do, we break the page up into pieces. And then we move to a service-oriented architecture, and we do use client-side rendering. I'll talk more about what that means. We also use edge-side includes to rewrite the page at the edge. And all of these things together let us improve our cache efficiency. That means that we can hopefully deliver one page and have it appear differently for everybody who visits. So here's how we did it. I'm going to explain what Akamai and edge-side includes are. Let's say I you apologize are. for what you're getting ready to see. <laughs> um, if, let's say you're a veterinary office and one of the services you perform for the community is you post lost, lost dog posters. So what you'll be doing is somebody will bring you a photo of their dog, you'll go all the way to the la uh, large format printer, get the large format printed versions of it, come back to your office and give them the poster. And you'll do this over and oop, over and over and over again. <laughs> so 90% of your time is spent going back to the printing office and coming back. Well, you don't have to do it that way. What might make more sense is to take the reusable portions of the page, go to the large format printer and print, say, 10,000 copies and put them in a literal cache in the corner. This is what Akamai does for us. 
So that blank spot, we have a regular printer in our office that can print photos that size, so that means we don't have to go anywhere. We can spend more of our time doing the stuff we're efficient at. So we take the photo, we paste it in there, and then we de uh, deploy them all over the office. That space, that blank space that we fill, that's the equivalent of what edge side includes do for us. So you can see how that might come in handy when we're building the page. So what we do is we divide the pages up into the pieces that um, align with those buckets that we just described. First, there are the heavy services, page layout, asset metadata, such as image URL, article body, things like that, things that don't change very often but are very heavy to get. Drupal, despite all of its benefits, is a, a little bit heavy as an app server. So then we've got the heavy services that are actually reused fairly frequently. Related content, featured content, menus, things like the title menu that appears at the top of the page. You got 60,000 assets out there, articles, and you want to make a change to the header menu, you don't want to invalidate the cache for all 60K. So you put it in an edge site include and spit it out. Thin services, these are things that change very rapidly and are very unique on a per user basis. These are the things that you might use a caching layer for, or a uh, services layer for, that we would have something other than Drupal that is thinner and a lot easier to uh, scale. The, we're talking um, about using Drupal for the heavy services. We'll just deliver the base page outright. We'll use Angular and ESI to deliver some of these moderately dynamic pages. And we'll use Angular and a data caching layer to deliver the thin services. So again, what we do is we take the page, look at the parts that change, turn those into modules, and then we create a system that will render those modules based on our particular needs. TTL of five days at the top, let's make that an ESI. TTL of one minute for the forecast, let's make that an Angular module. So just to summarize, we uh, take the page, deliver the base page with the placeholders for the widgets, put the information that's relevant to, on a per user basis into our data services cache, we use ESI and Angular to rewrite the page as it goes out to the user's pay, uh, uh, browser. And so the user from Houston and the user from Texas can get personalized pages, but Drupal only ever delivers one. So fr from this perspective, the app server does very little work. All the rest of the magic is happening at Akamai and in the thin services, which are far easier to scale. So we've already mentioned the data services layer a couple times, um, specifically as a, one of the critical components of the overall infrastructure reboot. Um, the data services, when we, when we decided we needed to build that, we knew we were going to need something that had, you know, thin services, a thin RESTful API, um, one that was easily adaptable, easily um, that could track with the feature requests that um, are created from the company. So as new features are requested, we need new data. We need data to, to provide those features. We have to build the front-end functionality to present it, but we've got to get the data first. So we needed a system that we could work closely with um, the teams can work closely with so that we could be working in unison building these products. Um, you know, we built it using um, MongoDB and Scala, uh, functional language, um, state-of-the-art type technology, uh, delivering data through JSON, key value type um, data. It's been live for quite some time. We're already using it on our mobile apps. If you've downloaded our new mobile app, if you haven't yet, you need to go ahead and do that. Um, the mobile app is using our, 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 our data services layer um, live today, and we are building on top of that with, with Drupal. Um, so in support of uh, the needing high cacheability, we're, we're moving to a client-side model. So we mentioned earlier that we've got about 144 servers running our site. Our current plan is to run them, to run our site with about 15 or 16 servers um, at, um, in, in the cloud so that we don't um, we can ramp up if we need it, um, but hopefully with our cacheability and the cache rates that we're going to be getting out of our different cache layers and with Akamai, um, we hope that we can operate in that, at that level. Um, but the client-side model is based on AngularJS. If those of you have not, if you're not familiar with AngularJS, it's a JavaScript framework created by Google. Um, if you heard, haven't heard of AngularJS, I'm sure you've heard of jQuery, same kind of thing. Um, but it's a, a, a model view controller, an MVC type um, product, um, allows separation of presentation and data access, um, gives great flexibility in building uh, functionality for the web. Uh, we use it um, with our mechanism for building AngularJS modules. Um, we try to build our, our, our directive, my boss's directive, <laughs> is to build modules that are completely responsive where it makes sense. So I can build a module, a current conditions module, 
that works on a big web page and a mobile web page. But if I have to go through great links to make it responsive, to make it work across both, then we may build two modules. But, but AngularJS gives us that, that, that granularity or that flexibility to be able to build um, in the way that we need to build it. Um, the client side model also, the cornerstone of it is highly cacheable templates. Jason's already mentioned um, the templates previously that had the blue boxes. Um, you know, Drupal publishes the base page one time, it gets cached for maybe forever, or maybe, you know, whatever that TTL might be, and, and the Angular JS, the modules that are on the page, dynamically pull data um, and push that load down to the browser um, so that we have fewer hits back to origin. Um, the AngularJS will actually, we already talked about this, already calls our data services layer, um, and within the data services layer, I'm sorry, within the Angular module, the data component of the Angular module, we also cache the data there as well. So if, if you're cruising through six web pages on our site, and in one page you make a call to the data, data services layer and get current condition data or forecast data, we'll cache that in the browser, we'll cache that in the model of the of Angular, so we don't have to go back to the data services layer to get refreshed data when we know that that data has not expired. Um, so it makes the pages very quick. It makes the modules very fast to load. So additionally, um, we already talked a little bit about content entry. Um, content entry has, has always been a big problem because we're trying to become, you know, one of our four S's is storytelling. And we do a lot of that storytelling through writing compelling articles um, that that have some meaning to a wide variety of people. Um, in order to do that, you've got to be able to rapidly create those articles, and you need to be able to create those articles that have some, something that's more engaging than just a wall of text. Um, so we try to build the articles as much as possible, including rich media, videos, imagery, slideshows, um, YouTube videos, we can insert Twitter feeds, we can do there's like 13 different types of rich media that we can bring into an article to make it um, less boring as if it were not there. Um, but ultimately, we have to do it in a way that, that articles cross-platform. Um, we can build an article, we can write an article that works on big web all day long, that's awesome, but the guy that's on the mobile website, if he can't see that article, then you know we're not covering all of our bases. So the articles have to be written and, and created in such a way that it works across all our sites, our mobile web, our big web, our mobile web, and our mobile apps. So here's an example of what this looks like. Again, what we're trying to do is make it so that the front end team doesn't have to write HTML or JavaScript to put rich media in the page. We also don't want to copy and paste some embed code from some other site that may work today but not work tomorrow. We want to retain control over that because not only do we want to make sure that whatever is being used is up to date, but we want to make sure that if it maintains a look and feel appropriate for whatever device it's going towards. So what we've done is we use the WYSIWYG editor, which you may be familiar with using in Drupal, and we have added a couple of buttons here dynamically. These buttons represent the types of uh, weather nodes that they're able to add to the body. So in this case, we've got an image weather node and a video weather node. Now, of course, those aren't the actual image. That just represents the placeholder for it. When you click the button bar, you'll get a pop-up. This one's for, say, uh, YouTube, I think. So in this case, they're adding a video of fish with teeth. Um, relevant to the weather, and what we've hey, been, easy <laughs> we've simplified the interface so that the the user only sees what they're supposed to see. This is also limited by user uh, role, so a, an administrator may see more options than a regular content editor. So. Um, one of the ways that we were able to get this flexibility is because this modal that you see here, this is actually a cr content type create form. This is an this is an actual node. So um, for those of you familiar with Drupal. So this is actually a weather node uh, YouTube content type. So after the user uh, creates this, it just goes ahead and dumps it in the article body. Right, so then in the, the screen to my left, you see four basic presentations. You see a big web presentation, a tablet presentation, a mobile web presentation, and a, and a data feed. Um, down below the bottom, you see the raw article body. It should look somewhat familiar as the WYSIWYG um, article editor for in Drupal. What, are you seeing something different? No, I want to see how much time I have. Okay, we have about uh, 10 minutes. Um, down below you see the actual article body. Um, and then we insert a, um, in this case we insert a YouTube weather node, Wix node as Jason calls it, 
um, into the article body, and above you see the different presentations of the different platforms. On Big Web, you might see a immersive um, type um, embed player for the YouTube video. On the tablet, you might see something a little bit different, maybe uh, something that's a little more of an embed type um, placement. And on mobile web, you see uh, maybe a smaller version of that, a smaller image. And over on the right, in our in the data, in the in the data feed, you might see um, an XML um, an XML you know excerpt that um, some platform that would be consuming that data would then take that XML data to use to uh, to present that weather node that that YouTube video in their their platform um, in, in the way that's appropriate for their platform. So as I said before, the weather nodes, they, they are full-featured nodes. They're first-class entities. Um, they're really nodes with benefits because these are nodes that can be used within the button bar. What, I, what is it? <laughs> Move on. They're trackable. There must be some, in, uh, th some insinuation from that that I don't get. They're trackable, flexible, so you can use them in multiple places. They can stand alone as full first-class entities. That YouTube video exists on the site. You can use it for a number of things. You might just drop it into a feed somewhere as it is. Um, so the, um, to kind of drive home the point, here's that button bar again. You can see the YouTube one. There's an external image, internal image, Twitter. And here are the content types that represent them. Now, this is where I can really go off the rails in terms of deep technical detail. Do not go off the rails. I've decided I'm not going to go off the rails on deep technical detail. Good call. <laughs> right then. So um, we have Wix node entities, the first class entities. Those are nodes. We have tokens in the article body, as you saw represented by those little short images. And we want to manage the presentations of them. We want to have it present differently, whether you're viewing on the big web, mobile, desktop, uh, iPhone la landscape, or maybe even in an XML feed. So what we did for that, skipping technical details. Skipped over, yeah. <laughs> All right, so one of the critical parts of, of actually carrying out the, the, the page serving is the creation of the presentation framework. And, and Jason architected the presentation framework. Where basically, it's a mechanism for allowing us to put modules on a page. Um, those modules can be Angular modules. They can be um, PHP modules. They can be inline code, uh, but effectively, gives us the ability to serve them either statically being served by Drupal or being served by an ESI, um, depending on what the use case is and what the hit is back to origin. Um, one of the main benefits is simplifying the creation of modules um, for the functionality that we're trying to build rapidly. If, we're, if our developers are, their core language is, is AngularJS and their focus is building on AngularJS modules, they can, they can build their AngularJS talking to our data services layer, they can build it rapidly um, in their own environment, in their test environment, and they can do it without knowing a whole lot about Drupal. So we can leverage, we're able to leverage a lot of our existing talent because we have a lot of strong JavaScript, HTML, and CSS people. Um, so it simplified a little bit of the, of the creation process because we didn't have to go hire a bunch of PHP developers, not that there's anything wrong with that, it's just we didn't have any of them. Um, so AngularJS is, makes that easier for us, and the presentation framework supports that natively. So again, I just wanted to summarize what we've all gone through. Um, we have little panels, those little widgets we talked about. These, are, these widgets that are on this page, they're outlined in blue and red. These are actually presentation framework modules. That the, the presentation framework mod system was built to serve these. So it uh, basically creates panel panes that are also just independently renderable. They're uh, reusable, exportable. That is to say you can deploy them in Git. So they, uh, as part of the panel, when you're doing your layouts, you, do, you build a seasonal page, say. You can export that as a feature, reuse it next year. So um, each of them is independent. So that means they all have their own uh, configuration. So uh, panel serializes it with it so it goes out with the feature. Uh, and their version. So if it happens that, um, and this is a point I'm not sure we made very clearly, but the development team that's actually creating the presentation framework modules, that's the Weather Channel team. And they're doing this right using uh, straight HTML, JavaScript, and an info file in JSON. So these are really straightforward modules to build, and they want to be able to build a lot of them. 
So they're independently versioned because let's say that there's a forecast module that we later on decide we want to add a title to. Well, all the extant versions need to be updated or, or uh, we have to write code that acknowledges that the old versions exist. So we track uh, where all the modules are used. We have a thing that tells you how often something's used to kind of get popularity and maybe feed into metrics. So um, last slide before I skip ahead again, but each of the modules are just a single folder that contains details about how the system works. The JSON file indicates whether or not this particular module is going to be delivering using ESI or if it's going to be using Angular or if it's going to be just displayed static. The template files, the tipple FIPS, can be um, PHP templates, so you can put code in there, though it's strongly discouraged for obvious reasons. So just to summarize, we have the article body. They click a button. They get a pop-up that allows them to choose a YouTube video, say, enter a little bit of details. They save it, enters the article body, and it's available for presentation differently on all the various uh, outputs that we have. All right, so page building is big. Um, before we can actually you know, present something to our end users, we have to have a page. And today our current page building process is, is not horrible. It's similar to how we do it with Drupal in that there's modules. We put modules on the page. Um, but it's not near as flexible and not quite doesn't support the the rapid page building that we need. Um, currently, our system it doesn't doesn't really handle the the many templates that we have. They're hard to track. They're hard to they're hard to find. They're hard to reuse. It's it's just not a very efficient system um, for you know a highly optimized team. Um, we need URL parity across all of our platforms. We don't have that today, um, partly because of our current content management system, but partly because of the legacy technical debt that we have that we're trying to get rid of. Drupal gives that to us. It provides a mechanism to give us URL parity across big web, mobile web, and, and even when we bring our international properties into, into our Drupal, we should be able to do the same. Um, and then our current environment, it's, it's, an, inflexible lay, it's, it's an inflexible layout. The, what happens when you try to drag a module and you need to configure it, um, the configurability of it is, is really painful. And you have little to no control over setting parameters, controlling how that module is going to behave on the page. So we wanted to have a mechanism that we could easily configure a module. We could use a single module for a current condition module in three places and make that module behave differently um, in those three places, in, in all three places, without having to have three different modules. And we need a flexibility in how those modules are configured. And Drupal gives us a lot of flexibility in how we do that where our current system does not. So one of the ways we addressed all those requirements, we use a system called Panels. A lot of you are probably familiar with it, familiar with Drupal. It is a um, very intimidating system at first, but once you get through the training, uh, it's a very powerful and flexible framework. It, and what it, we're using for in our case is it allows us to group uh, a lot of the related uh, variants of a page. So for example, we're talking about a forecast page. There may be a variant that exists for big web. There may be a variant for mobile web. It may have a different layout if the site is in severe mode versus not. There may also be a situation where we deliver a 404 page with a specific type of layout. So uh, that gives us simpler management of those, those various aspects. In the past, you would have had to go to a completely different place, maybe search for the page layout, maybe edit it in HTML or JSP. Um, we don't necessarily want to expose people to that pain. The other thing is we get to better reuse those variants. Once we built something once, we can clone it and reuse it on other pages. So let me uh, give you an example of the type warning. <laughs> Can we give you an example of the type of layouts we have available to us? <laughs> wow, nothing, guys? You're already asleep. Um, so we gave uh, the Weather Channel a series of layouts. These are um, basically nine layouts that we gave them. And this might be uh, considered inflexible if we didn't give them also the ability to, to m modify the layout within it. So you can see here, this is something a break from what you might get in a normal panels interface. We have a single row, but we have two widgets side by side. The way we did that, we introduced a module called Classy Panels. And what Classy Panels does is it allows you to change settings by uh, saying that for this particular pane, we want it to be 50% width or 33% width, and it'll automatically acclimate to the size of the container. So here's an example of it in use. Go ahead and set that to 33% width, and boom, we can drag it from one section to another, and then instant layout happiness. So, sorry. Uh, so variants. Um, one of the benefits of, of panels is it gives us the ability to choose variants. So provides, um, largely provides our capability for doing URL parity, but also providing different pages for the same URL for different conditions, different contexts. That context might be a different device. It could be mobile web over, 
over big web. It could be a severe weather situation versus a non-severe situation. Um, but other types of rule, any type of rule that we might need to configure in the future, a sponsorship maybe, um, could allow us for that same URL to show a different page variant, which creates an extremely flexible um, solution for presenting pages to the user. So the context to what they're doing and where they're at and the conditions that are going on where they're at is, is highly taken into consideration. All right, so um, we're able... We're able, to, we're able to use selection rules in panels, and what those selection rules are, they're basically UI-driven, uh, um, uh, well, selection rules. They allow you to choose what basis particular variants are chosen. So here's a, a use case. We have these six layouts for, say, a forecast page. If we are looking at the forecast page for a location we know exists, we don't need the 404 versions of it. And if we're visiting from a big web versus a mobile browser, we don't need the mobile variants. Oh. And if we know the weather is in severe mode, we'll use the severe variant. And so the selection rules drive which layout is actually delivered. And then we, um, Drupal has made the page generation process simpler. So what's next? Um, Jason's been promising me a continuous integration environment for a while. So I think we're getting close to getting that in place. Um, continuous. Um, right, Jason? I'm continuously promising it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Performance testing, we're, 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 long, we're a long way into the project. Uh, we hope to have a launch this year. Um, if we don't, we're all fired. Um, <laughs> but performance testing is, 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 is really big, and we hope to get into that in the next couple of months. Still have some functionality to build, but we feel confident that we can take care of it this year. Uh, so a number of contrib modules have come out of this. These are the ones that uh, probably are worth the most attention. We discussed how these modules during the presentation. Custom uh, or classy panel styles, that was one we developed that allowed you to change the way the layout worked within the pre-existing layouts. There's actually going to be a power session on this a little bit later. Uh, Derek Durabs and Kendall Totten are delivering it to, uh, together. It'll be at the Media Current booth. Um, Wix node framework, that is to say the, um, the one that allowed you to drop um, rich media elements into the article body, that's becoming WYSI field, and that's already in Sandbox. That'll be mailed available soon. I'll put that in the presentation notes. I didn't have the Sandbox URL available to me. And the presentation framework, it has a little bit more work to be done before it's rounded out enough to be a generic module. There are too many uh, Weather Channel specific things in there. So that one's uh, coming up as well, and these will be really great additions to the Drupal community. Thank you. So b before we take any questions, I just I do want to thank. Um, I give them a hard time, but we've um, we've really enjoyed our relationship with Media Current, and I want to thank you know Jason and Dave and all the other Media Current guys, and and also Acquia. Acquia has been a great partner with us from the day that we started this, helping us with with high level architectural decisions and and really guiding us through this. So. Thank, thanks to both Media Current and, um, and Acquia for their guidance along the way. Also, our, our friends at NBCU, big, uh, big help in mentoring us early on to, to kind of push us in this direction to make sure that we're validating again that we're making the right decision. So um, we have a mic in the back if there's any questions. What is your content deployment strategy going to be like with so many different articles? Are you deploying from stage to prod? Are your people directly on production? Could you talk about that for a little bit? One of you? Yeah, the article creation is actually going to happen on a production instance, so the articles will be made available. The reason for this is that the delay between the, uh, that comes from moving from a staging environment to production environment and the benefits that they get from it was deemed not worth the effort. The articles are also fairly volatile. It's okay if we lose one or two. The ones that are evergreen, those are stored. So, and Do you have any concerns about having a cold cache when you do clear the cache on production? No. How come? <laughs> um, part of our process is we are going to be writing some, um, uh, what do you call it? A cache um, crawler? Push expiry? No, no, no. Where were you? You prime the ca cache, cache primers? Primer. Yeah, cache primers. So, yeah, and the cache priming will be easier because, of course, Drupal manages all the assets. And we're going to have a, a system set up that parallelizes the, the priming. So, thank you. For the uh, section you're embedding, the information, the, the rich media, are you actually embedding some sort of token into the body field, or are you, how is that, how are yeah. you doing that? Yeah, it is actually, it's a, it is a token, but it's not a token API token, and the reason for that is that token API does some things that we wanted to, we wanted to do a little bit differently. We wanted more control over the end-to-end. -end. And so we use our own token. We, invo we use hook filter info to declare a filter processor, and we process it on, on presentation. 
Does that answer the question? Yeah. Question for Chris. Uh, do you have any colleagues in media or in uh, tech who questioned or continue to question your decision for Drupal? Um, not just really. Us. Um, yeah, just media current. <laughs> um, no, not really. I mean, we, like I said, we've at least in, you know, in inside the Weather Channel. Um, surprisingly, we were not questioned at all, um, largely because of our support of open source for a long time. Um, outside of the Weather Channel. Um, I've not read, I mean, we've not really, you know, broadcasted what we're doing, um, so to speak. So there's not really been, I guess, an avenue for people to uh, tell us that we're crazy for going that route. Um, but we have a tendency to do what we want anyway, so we really don't care. Uh, but no, to answer your question, we've not heard any, any, any negatives about this, this, this decision. So I saw you had sort of preview images maybe just on your slides uh, between the different like big web mobile layouts and so on. Do you have any sort of preview tool for content editors to see what it's going to look like in different contexts? So we're using publication status and the ability to view unpublished versus published articles and the way that the firewalls are basically built up to do previewing. Um, we started on a process of uh, enhancing the built-in panels preview system, but um, given the amount of effort it looked like that was going to take, we, we stuck with, what we've, with the presentation. Yeah. So with how you're using Angular, it seems like you've probably got a few round trips before all your content's fully loaded. Have you guys had difficulties or seen complaints around that? No, we've done a couple of tests, but the, the key thing, to, I think what you're getting at is that every one of the Angular modules is going to do its own request. And in actual fact, um, the, many of the requests are of a similar type, and the, the queries are built to be aggregatable, so you can do a single query and, and get aggregate results. So there's an abstraction layer between the Angular modules and the, the, call, the service calls, and that manages which call, how many calls actually get made. So if you're requesting six articles, it requests all six from a single request rather than six round trips. Now, that is, um, that there still are a number of round trips that happen in Angular, but, but the way the page is built, we're minimizing the impact of it. Again, it all goes back to the cacheability, cacheability of the data. Um, in the browser itself, on the client, cacheability of the data, the data services layer at Akamai, um, caching of the page template. There's so much caching involved that um, you know, we obviously wanted to reduce as, as, as much as possible the hits back on Drupal because um, we don't want to have to load every page that comes to our site loaded out of a database. Um, by the different layers of cacheability, we're confident that will give us the, the performance that we need, even though you're right, there are, there are a lot of hits outside that, on that page going to our data services layer, but we're, you know, the testing we've done have shown that it will, you know, be performant. When you talk about the data services layer, is that completely external from Drupal and then you just bring in that data at the time of rendering? Yeah, it's a completely separate system that was built with Scala um, on MongoDB, um, and it's kind of a, 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 almost a data warehouse of data that comes from multiple sources, um, disparate sources from our weather forecasting data. Um, we push all of our article content into it, um, and it basically pushes it out into the cloud. Um, RESTful API into that has no touch points with Drupal whatsoever other than the calls that we make to it. And Drupal pushes content into it, yeah. Yeah, Drupal pushes the article content into it, for sure. Yeah, the idea behind the, the data services layer is that it's, um, it basically it's a, a really powerful key value store. And, th and as you know, key value stores are very easy to scale. So this took the most um, you know, traffic demanding part of the entire equation and made it a lot simpler to manage. And the group that works on that data services layer, just go a little bit deeper since you asked about it, um, we sit right beside them. We've got web developers, our core reboot team, um, and, and the group that builds that data services layer. So we're all, you know, we could reach out and, again, touch each other. Um, so we're very close, and, and though we're not in production with this platform yet, the idea is that once we go into production, as new products are, are, are requested by our, our product teams and the developers, you know, decide, you know, work with, with that, that, that back-end data services group, to figure out what data we need. We work closely together to, to provide the services that we need if they don't already exist. A lot of cases they might not already exist. So we feel it'll be a very rapid type you know, relationship. Any other questions? 
I feel you with the microphone, I'm really lazy. Did you have any problems with data migration, any challenges that you could speak about? Um, what he said was that he was really lazy. <laughs> and he thoroughly enjoyed the presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, we have had a lot of data migration problems, not necessarily because of data migration problems, but because we've changed our minds several times on, you know, on how, you know, what we want the data to look like. Specifically, um, one of the areas of, that was kind of a pain was um, on the weather nodes. Um, we changed a lot of the formats and how we wanted them to work so they could, when they originally built, they were built to work with our, our website, and that's it. They weren't built to work with our mobile website and how they were structured and the, the way the fields were named and all that. Um, we also have a lot of data with you know, images and videos and just, just lots and lots and lots of data. And trying to make sure that we do the right things with that data, bring it over in the right way that fully maximizes SEO, um, categorization, um, it's, been, it's been a real pain. Um, and frankly, one of the harder things that we've done on this project. Um, so great question, but yeah, it was, it's, it's, we're not 100% there yet. We've made, you know, we're probably 80%, 80, 85% done with our data migrations. Um, we had to do some data migrations when we did our original um, Drupal um, uh, content entry solution because we had to bring a bunch of data over. Um, but we're rebuilding all that with, with, with our reboot project. And we've got most of it done, but it has been kind of painful. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Paul, I'll be lazy. You mentioned SEO. Uh, one of the things that client side rendering uh, tends to be not very SEO friendly. So, do you have a strategy or techniques that you're using for the content pulled in with Angular? Yeah, the, the, the strategy primarily revolves around PhantomJS. So, we're doing PhantomJS to help provide a lot of that. And just in case it wasn't captured, the question is what was our response to SEO problems rising from rewriting the page in JavaScript? Yeah. And just, you know, anecdotally, um, I don't know if anyone's read the article, um, but Google now has announced that they're going to start, um, when, they, when they're doing their crawling, they're going to start rendering the page more like a browser and actually executing the JavaScript. Um, we're not 100% sure if that's going to give us the SEO lift that we need, but potentially could drastically reduce our need for PhantomJS. This literally happened last week or week before last, so it's late breaking news, but good news nonetheless. Can you talk a little bit more about how the images So the question was, um, can we talk a little bit more about how we're managing images? You want me to take this one or do you? Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll handle it. Um, so we're, we're doing it differently today. The way we're doing it with, um, if I leave anything out, you can fill in. Um, the way we're handling Im images today with our, our, our interim content entry solution is, is different than the way we're doing it, you know, in our new platform. Um, today, in our current platform, since it has to work with our existing web serving platform, we're storing, we're using the same images that have always been there. Uh, we just import the metadata and we're tracking them in Drupal. Um, after we did the data imports. In the future, what's happening is the images will get loaded into, into Drupal through normal upload functionality, just like we're doing today, um, and we're storing the metadata for those images, images, pushing those mezzanine images to S3 and AWS, um, and our data services engine has a mechanism, uh, a service that will provide image cutting for us. So once we push those, those mezzanine images into the data services layer, um, as the different clients need images um, for pages or articles or whatever, they can make a call um, and, and grab that image. Huh? I don't think we need it, right? So, does that answer the question? We're managing the metadata, so the searching and um, applying images to articles and using images in and our media modules and content surfacing inside Drupal and through that interface is using that image metadata, but Drupal is not housing the actual images. Well, the mezzanines it is, yeah. sort of. So we're using a media module, um, storage API, and the, files, the images are stored as file entities. 
uh, storage APIs delivering them in S3, including the mezzanines. So it basically keeps track of the, of the where the, they're being stored. When they're requested, they're actually pulled from S3, resliced, and delivered locally. Um, but in the case and of then, things, and then cached, and then cached, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.